Put it simply, a lofty assignment. Amen. I want you to hear me today. By lofty, I mean ambitious, visionary, grandiose, grand, generous, or magnanimous. I do not mean arrogance nor haughtiness. As a church, saints, I need you to hear me today. The Lord is actually calling us to raise the bar and to shift to another level of service in him. When it comes to African Americans, there is, excuse me, the soft bigotry of low expectation. The bar is always and automatically lowered when it comes to us. And I hate to say this, but when it comes to church, there is not the not so soft, but there is the overt bigotry of low expectations. We are constantly trying to find ways to do less. Good to see you, Andre to make this thing easier. To spend as little time in God's presence as possible. And the hypocrisy of it is we've taken something that God made, that God made beautiful, that God created, and in many cases we, com we, co we call that which belongs to God. We use it to justify not seeking God. Often you hear now people saying, well, some preachers have even canceled services. So we want to spend time with family. Is church the only thing that's cutting into your family time? What about all the other things that we do? Why, why, how is that which is designed to strengthen the family? That which taught you how to be a good man in the first place, based on what you said. That which has taught you how to be a good wife. How has that, the institution that undergirds the family, marriage, the Apostle Paul compared it to the relationship between Christ and his church. How then are these things? or is that this institution a threat to your family? The job is not a threat to the family. Playtime is not a threat to the family. That woman on the side is not a threat to the family. Man on the side is not a threat to the family. Praise the Lord. All the other things that are in our lives are not threats to the family, but the church is a threat to the family we can't get any rest because we're at church. We can't sleep because we're at church. We are allowing the enemy to do a job on our minds to where the Lord is crowded out. Now, this was prophesied. The Bible tells us that the, in the last day church, the Bible tells us where Christ will be found. And it's not on the choir. 
nor is he in the pulpit, nor will he be found in the pews. Bible tells us that in the last day we will find Christ at the door of the church, knocking, trying to get in. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. The prophet Jeremiah called for a raising of the bar. Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 19. Um, well, let me read 18 and 19. Jeremiah, I could read 15 through 19, but for time's sake. 18, he says, why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable? which refuseth to be healed, wilt thou uh, be altogether unto me as a liar and as the waters that fail. Jeremiah is accusing God of letting him down. He's charging the Lord. Uh, Brother Ben, Sister uh, Thomas, he's charging the Lord foolishly. You all didn't do that. Jeremiah did. He, Lord, why can't I get well? The Lord checks him in verse 19. He says, therefore, thus saith the Lord, if thou will return. That is, the Lord said to Jeremiah, get yourself together. Pull yourself together. Then I will bring thee again, and thou shalt stand before me. And if thou take forth the precious from the vile, if you separate that which is holy from that which is worthless. He says, thou shalt be as my mouth. If you stand up and declare my truth and, and put a difference between holy and unholy, clean and unclean, he says, you shall be as my mouth. Then he says this, let them return unto thee, but return not unto them. Challenge them to come up. Don't dumb down. Challenge the people to rise to the occasion instead of being silent as we slowly uh, but surely give ground. Amen. God is calling us to raise the bar. To do this, my room members and those who are streaming, those who will hear this, God will need 100% buy-in from as many of us who will say, Lord, I want to put my shoulder to the plow. God is calling for all hands to be on deck. Even the wonderful members who support the church, and we love you, but you're not involved. The Lord is talking to you. We need your back. We need your hands. We need your shoulders. Yes, we need your prayers, but we need more than your prayers. What if all of us just prayed and did nothing else? Very little would get done. God has deposited in, deposited in you uh, abilities. Talents, strength, insight. You may not know that you have it, but you do. And the kingdom is calling you in these last and evil days. The single men, the single women, the married couples, the teenagers, the college students, the mothers, the fathers, the young and the aged, God's calling for us. The times dictate that every one of us put our shoulder to the plow. Everybody today, I want you to listen up and hear what the Lord has to say to us. The way that God is going to use us to accomplish some of his Lofty goals is that according to verse 12, God's going to use us 
through raising up the foundations of many generations. That is raising up the age old foundations or restoring the foundations that were laid many generations ago. Praise the Lord. Psalms 11 and 3 declares that if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The foundations there, he was speaking of the established institutions that bring about social and civil order. We see more and more in our country, uh, in the streets of our nation, anarchy. We see paid protesters. We see people picking up uh, trash cans and various things, and they are vandalizing property, blocking the streets, uh, causing opinions to be silenced. This is anarchy. This is a threat to the established institutions that hold our society together. Saints, we can't have a society. We can't have a world if chaos is the order of the day. And the saints cannot be threatened into going off somewhere in a corner and being silent. If there's ever been a time for your voice to be heard, the time is now. Psalms 82 and verse 5 says, uh, They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. Then he says this, All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Foundations, they're God's order. They're trying to put God's order out of course. God made them, I talk about it all the time, male and he made them female. God declared that marriage is a union between a man and a woman. God declared that uh, homosexuality and lesbianism is wrong. God declares that the killing of the unborn is wrong. Amen. God has declared that adultery and fornication is wrong. I showed them today in the book of Jeremiah where when the people no longer wanted to obey the word of God, the people declared that the problem was not the wicked behavior of the people, but the problem was the word of the Lord. We live in a day now where the Bible is the problem. It's not the wicked. It's not the murderer. It's not the, uh, the abortion provider. Praise the Lord. It's not the pervert. It's not the transgendered person. It is the Bible. It is those who dare call a spade a spade. We're the problem. Praise the Lord. Today, it is not a sin to practice abomination. The new sin is to speak against it. Isn't that amazing? God said in uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 10, the Lord says, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? He says, behold, their ear is uncircumcised. That is, their ears are closed and they cannot hearken. They've been in sin so much now that they can't obey. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. It's the word that's the problem. Not our behavior. Not, not the shacking up. That's not the problem. It's these judgmental churches that speak uh, uh, and make people feel bad. That's the problem. Isn't it amazing that the new problem in society are, is the, are the standards of God and not the wickedness of the people? Oh, my. As never before, we've got to raise up the foundations that were laid years ago. That is, they shall raise up to the top and finish completely the building that was started, but, but the construction stopped. They set out to build the building, and for whatever reason, they ran out of money. 
For whatever reason, the construction was halted and the only thing that has been there for years was the foundation. God says, I'm calling you to finish that project. I'm, I, the Lord is saying, there are things that I've started in you that I began to work on in you that I want to finish. Paul said, being confident of this very thing, that he is able to complete that which he hath begun in me. That which the Lord hath started in us, the Lord can and will complete. If we let him. All of us have areas of incompleteness. Areas of shortcoming. Things that the Lord hath started that, that God wants to complete in our lives. But in order for this to happen, we've got to allow him to. We've got to not see the standards of God as the problem. Paul admitted, he said, there are times when I fall or when I fail beneath the standards of the law. He said, but I still must consent that the law is holy and the law is righteous. Even when I miss it, it is still right. Somebody today ought to shout, the Bible is right. He's a Lord. See, see that, that, that's the, that is something wonderful to know because, you see, you can't come up to something, uh, to the standards of the word, if you dismiss the word. If we decide that there are no standards, then there is no hope, praise the Lord, of coming up to the standards of God. Am I right about that? The word of the Lord is right. The word of the Lord is holy. Paul said in Romans 7 and 11, for sin, taken occasion by the commandment, he personifies sin. He says, sin deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Praise the Lord. Even if I missed it, it's still holy. Praise the Lord. Even when I fell short, it's still holy. It's still just and it is still good. And when the preacher preached the holy, just, and good word of God, I have to say amen. And I've got to come up to it because amen is still just. Even if I have fallen beneath, notice I'm staying right here for a moment because some of us, praise the Lord, when the word finds us, we get upset with the preacher. Well, who do he think he is? Well, the preacher, first of all, he didn't write the Bible. Praise the Lord. As long as it's Bible, if it's Bible, you can't argue with the word. And yet we live in a day now where people are beginning to do that. I'm amazed that people, when the word finds them, my brothers, they, they, you'll find them saying now, well, who wrote the Bible? Who you think wrote the Bible? God wrote the Bible. And he used human instrumentality to write it. And he watched over his word and performed it. Good God Almighty. The Bible is the word of God. It was the word of God before you were born. It will be the word of God when you're dead and gone. Praise the Lord. The Bible is right. And as never before, we've got to come up to the Bible. And don't you let the devil cause you to see the things of God as a threat to your well-being. Being in God's presence is not a threat to your family. Prayer is not a threat to your children. Bible study is not a threat to your family. Good God Almighty. As a matter of fact, it will cause healing to take place. Lord God Almighty, it will cause the blessings of the Lord to come your way in a mighty way. Somebody say amen. amen. Now let's look at this for just a few minutes and I'm going to preach and we're going to go home. And we're getting ready for Wednesday night. Uh, the Lord instructed the prophet Isaiah to show them their error. To show Judah their sin. And let me tell you what he said to them. He said uh, in verse 1, Cry a lie. And he said, spare not. Don't spare anybody. Spare not literally means do not participate in political correctness. 
Don't worry about how it sounds. Just tell the truth without restraint and spare no one. Cry aloud. That is, lift up your voice. As a matter of fact, it says that lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression, their law breaking, their willful lawlessness, their willingness to deviate from my word, transgression, their willful deviation from my word. Show them why they have walked away from my standard and show the house of Jacob their sin. Amen. And he charges them. He charges them with perfunctory worship. Their worship was a pretense. He charges them with, uh, they dare to uh, challenge God on God's silence. And then he rebukes them for their self-initiated fasts and how they, believe it or not, ignored the Sabbath. God's going to judge us by how we treat his holy days. Amen. Sunday has gone from being the Lord's day to the Lord's 90 minutes, headed quickly to the Lord's 60 minutes, on his way to being the Lord's 15 minutes. After a while, it won't be the Lord's anything. We're giving ground. We're giving ground. Right as I speak, there are if, if it's not raining, and it may be out there anyway, there's soccer fields and fields throughout this county where brainless parents got their children out there chasing behind a ball rather than in the house of God learning about the Lord. I am a sports fan. I am a fan of many things that I talk against. What gets a thing in trouble with me is when it is offered in the place of God. See, anything that's offered in the place of God is antichrist. That's what anti means, opposed to and in the place of. The Bible speaks of, uh, uh, of the last days that there will be a spirit of antichrist. See, and anytime you offer a remedy that does not include Christ, that offer is antichrist. Well, he says, show them where they've gone wrong. Number one, he says, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. Now, it's amazing the power of a little word with just two letters, as. If you're looking at Isaiah 58 and 2, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation. That did righteous. Not that they were a nation that was doing right. But they, they're still going through the religious. It's perfunctory. They're still going through the services. They still show up. They still go show up at the time of worship. But they are not righteous. It's meaningless worship. See. It's, it's service with no life. Praise the Lord. You're faithful church attender, but it doesn't, it doesn't have an effect on you. It doesn't, it, it doesn't leave the four walls of the church. Still cuss like you're being cussing. Still fornicate like you're being fornicating. Still punking. Still gambling. Still drinking. See, it's not effective. It's, it's, this thing has to have an effect. See, it, it's got to do something other than get all in your hand. It's got to do something other than get all in your feet. It's got to affect you. For it to be real, it affects you when you get out there. I can't get much help today. I must, I must be in a Presbyterian church where they don't believe in saying amen. Oh my. He said they're like they're as a righteous nation. And forsook not the ordinances of their God. That is, they're behaving as though they didn't forsake the ordinance and the particular ordinance they're speaking of. Do you not know that the most powerful ordinance in the Old Testament was remember the Sabbath and keep it holy? It was the Lord's day. And the in, in Christianity, uh, Sunday is not the Christian Sabbath. 
we shifted. The, the, the disciples began to meet on Sunday, uh, being the first day of the week, to, to, because it was the day that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. Hence, Sunday, the word Sunday is a pagan title for that day. That's why we call Sunday a, a pagan title, title. We call it the Lord's Day because the Lord rolls again on Sunday morning. So this is a, this is a high worship day and it, held the, it holds the same place uh, with the Christians that the Sabbath uh, held in Judaism. And God says, now you all are worshiping me. You're coming before me behaving as though you were a true observer of the Sabbath. And I'm going to show you where they were not true observers of the Sabbath. And many of us are not true observers of the Lord's day. But we want the Lord to heal, deliver, set free, come through, make a way, raise us up, do this and do that. And the Lord says, you want all this from me, but what I notice from you is that you're neglecting me more and more and more. It doesn't work that way. Say amen. You can't, you cannot, you cannot write the rule. Now you may be a bad man. You may be one awesome sister, but you are no match for God. No human being can rewrite the rules and set, serve God according to their own terms. Now, Lord, this is the way I'm going to do this. The moment you say that to God, he laughs. You want to make God laugh? Show up with your plans. Show up telling him what you will and will not do. All of heaven go the ball. And they, they, they view you as a comedian. You're a regular a Steve Harvey. If you think it, that, that's going to work. Because the, the Lord has the first and the last say. say. Amen. He's two things. He's the beginning and the ending. Alpha and Omega. First and the last. I feel the Holy Ghost. God said, they come before me as my people. They act like they kept my ordinances. And they ask of me ordinances. Uh, look at this. They ask of me, excuse me, the ordinances of justice. And they take delight in approaching to God. That is, they come to me. They ask me for instructions. And they enjoy, praise the Lord, uh, coming near to They like having service. They like going through the motions. They're, they're very committed. Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day. God First.